In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, as we come and bring our brother priest, Father Pat Short, to his eternal rest, let us begin this celebration acknowledging our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with your body and blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that the soul of Patrick Joseph, your servant and priest, whom you honored with sacred office while he lived in this world, may exult forever in the glorious home of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Maccabees. Judas, the ruler of Israel, took up a collection among all his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an expiratory sacrifice. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection of the dead in view. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them in death. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead that they might be freed from this sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. Such is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of chains, like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I bear with everything for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, together with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we persevere, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Lord. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in word and deed before God and all the people how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning 
and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may the Lord give you his peace. It was just about 19 months ago that many of us were gathered here together in this church for a different kind of celebration than that which we are involved with today. That was back in June of 2016, and Father Pat was just celebrating his Golden Jubilee, 50 years of service given to the church as a priest. And so many of us who are here today were present for that celebration as well. That was a day of great joy and festivity. Today we gather again to celebrate the Eucharist. This day, though, I would say is a bittersweet day for us because we come to say goodbye to our father, our brother, our pastor, our friend, our teacher, our neighbor. Father Pat was all those things to all of us and so much more. And so this is an opportunity for us to give expression as a people of faith to the human aspect of the sorrow that we feel at having to say goodbye to such an outstanding priest, or as Father Pat Dolan described him at the vigil service last night, he was truly a priest's priest. And that means something, I think, to our, our fathers who are here. So there is that aspect of sadness that we acknowledge, without which we wouldn't really be human. Father Pat meant so much to all of us and it is that sense of no longer being able to hear his laughter, to hear him tell his stories, which we know were endless and of great variety. <laughs> All of those things, everything that made Pat, Pat. We are going to miss that aspect of being able to relate to him. And yet, this too is a day of celebration for us 
And he would be the first one to say, go ahead and shed your tears if you need to, but don't stop there. Remember that there is life beyond this life. Remember that there is hope. Remember that there is glory in our future. He would tell us all of those things today. And so it's a bittersweet day. I had the opportunity, after Father Pat told me, he didn't really ask me if I would give the homily at his funeral liturgy. He sort of just put my name down on the paper and then afterwards is, oh, I see my name is on the paper, so I guess you want me to do that. You know how Father Pat was sometimes. He, he presumed the goodness in others and that we would uh, help him out and do what he asked us to do. So after he uh, had asked me if I would be the homilist for this liturgy, I had the opportunity that I don't think many of us do for funeral uh, homilies, and that was to ask him, well, Pat, what do you want me to say? What sort of message do you want me to give? <laughs> and he was very quick in his reply. He said, first of all, Dave, don't talk too long. He said, people will get irritated. The hungrier they get, they're waiting for the luncheon. We need, to, we need to do the prayer, and we need to do it reverently, but we don't need to spend a lot of time there. Okay, so he said, keep it brief. Keep it short, S-H-O-R-T-T. <laughs> I said, okay, I hear you. And then he said, and for heaven's sake, don't go on and on about all the assignments that I had and all the different things that I was involved with because people who care about that sort of stuff can read it in my obituary. So he said, By now, you know, if they haven't read it, then they're probably not interested anyway, so don't bore them with that stuff. And he said, besides, what do you expect when you get to be as old as I am? Of course you're going to have a long list of places where you've been and uh, things that you've done. That was Father Pat. Then he said, what I really want you to talk about are the scriptures that I've chosen. Because he said, that's what every good homilist is supposed to focus on. And so, think about the readings that we just heard proclaimed. The first reading from the second book of Maccabees. It was Judas offering the gift, a sacrifice, to make up for the sins, the offense that his soldiers had committed. And Father Pat's intention in that of offering prayer and sacrifice for the deceased was to remind us of the value of doing just that. He was never very keen on homilists or celebrants who, in the interest of like wanting to make the family feel good about the deceased, would sort of canonize them, you know, so oh, we know that grandma is already in heaven with God and, enjoy, and playing with the angels and doing all this and that and the other stuff. Several times, a number of times in the course of my work with Father Pat, I had attended funerals where the celebrant or the homilist sort of did canonize, you know, list as an official saint, the deceased, and afterwards Father Pat would say, well, I thought only the Pope could do that. I guess we have a new Pope in town. It was always quiet, it was never, you know, it was never disrespectful, but it was just one of those little jabs, you know, like, don't do that. So, he wanted us to be sure to pray for him. As much as we believe and we hope and we trust that he is fully united with God in heaven, he still wants the support and the love that we express through our prayer. And that's a gift that we give to one another all the time, to pray for one another, the living and, and the dead. So he wanted to make sure that we got that message. In the second reading from St. Paul writing his second letter to St. Timothy, he wanted to give us that great, he wanted to remind us of that great assurance of the hope that we have that if we have died with Christ, we will live with him. And he's saying, that's what I tried to do that's what you need to do as well, each of us. If we have died with Christ in baptism, we believe our faith gives us the assurance that we will live with him. And if we endure with him, if we persevere, we shall reign with him. That is the message of Christian hope. 
that we're to celebrate every time we come together for a gathering such as this. And it was certainly, I think those words were, although they were chosen long before Father Pat's final ordeal with illness and declining physical health, certainly his experience, his personal experience of suffering uh, gave him a, a deeper share in the cross of Christ and a deeper uh, immersion in that whole experience of persevering. And he did, he persevered to the very end. And so that is the gift of our faith, that death is not the end. Death is a doorway. Death is a passage. And we believe that Father Pat has gone through that, and we trust and hope that he is now enjoying the beatific vision, fullness of life with God, the God whom he serves so faithfully and so well in this life. And then finally, the gospel that he chose it's interesting, I thought, that he tells me to be brief, but then he picks a very long gospel. <laughs> I guess that, you know, that was just his way. That's just the way he did things, you know? Oof. But <laughs> that gospel is, is a, kind of a, a classic text for us, for the disciples encountering the risen Lord Jesus and how Jesus acted asking them questions about their experience. That's what he did. That's what Father Pat did as a teacher. Anyone who was in any of his classes or you've heard his homilies, you know he did that. Uh, asking people questions, tapping into their experience, meeting them where they are, even if that's over a cup of coffee in the coffee shop, you know, that he was great for that, whatever, it didn't matter. Meet people where they are, ask them questions, establish a relationship, and then go deeper with them. What a scripture lesson that must have been when Jesus started with Moses and all the prophets and the whole Old Testament about himself. But that's what Father Pat did. He was a great teacher, formally and informally, throughout the whole course of his life. And of course, Father Pat would want to remind us of the centrality of what we're doing right here, celebrating the Eucharist, because it is here in this community of the church that we meet the risen Lord Jesus. We recognize him in the breaking of the bread, celebration of the Eucharist. And that was so central to Father Pat's life. As uh, Deacon Ray said during the vigil service for Father Pat last night, he calculated that Father Pat probably celebrated or concelebrated in excess of 27 or 28,000 masses in the course of his life. Just looking at how long he was a priest and taking an average and all the special celebrations and things. This is where Father Pat was truly himself, here at the Eucharist. And he wants to remind us of that, how important this needs to be to us as people have been blessed with Catholic Christian faith. Each of us has our own memories, our own impressions of how Father Pat touched us, touched our lives touched the communities that he pastored, the school where he taught. And I think that one way that we have of, of carrying forward his memory, and not just to remember him intellectually or up here, but to keep him alive in our heart and to keep his work continuing, the work that he did in the name of Jesus in the world, is to identify whatever characteristic it was, whatever it was about Father Pat that endeared him to you and to me, to remember whatever that quality was, and to strive then to live that in our own lives, to make that part of Father Pat still present in the world today through the way that we interact with other people. So what was it about him that you most enjoyed, that you most loved, that really and truly endeared him to you. I know for me, and up in Kirksville, I'm notorious for pulling out a mystery bag and pulling items out of it and things. I don't have, I forgot my bag, but I do have an item. I know that for me, it was Father Pat's joyful optimism. Always in his office, he had this copy of his family coat of arms, the short family coat of arms. And it has a motto on the bottom of it, spes in extremum, 
which for those of you who may not be quite so familiar with the Latin language means hope to the very end or hope in the most difficult of circumstances. And to me that really captures part of the essence of who Father Pat was. That no matter what the situation was, he maintained a joyful optimism, a hopefulness about whatever it was. No matter what the difficulty, no matter what the challenge, no matter what the obstacle, his approach was always, let's see what we can do to address the issue. Uh, who do I get, who can I call on to help me to do that? And then we do our best, and then we let the rest to God. We don't stew over it, we don't fret over it, we don't have all kinds of regrets and recriminations about it. Hope in all circumstances, even up to the very end. That is the quality that I will most seek to embody that I learned from Father Pat, and that I saw evident in his life all the time, even through his final illness. You may or may not know this about Father Pat, but he was from Ireland. <laughs> it is true, yes. And he had a favorite blessing that he would give to people, and it is the one that was incorporated into his memorial card, you know, the one that starts, may the road rise up to meet you. But he also had another favorite one that he would use a little more privately and kind of behind the scenes. And it was the one that went, may those who love us, love us. And for those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, then may he turn their ankles so, <laughs> so we will know them by their limping. <laughs> now, does that sound like Father Pat to you at all? I mean, such a pious and holy man, I can't imagine. But it is in the spirit, though, of Father Pat's Irish heritage that there was one final request that he asked of us at this particular liturgy. And, that is, and, and he, he, was so, he was so concerned about not wanting to overburden the choir and uh, the music folks that he said, now don't put this off on other people to do. You take the lead in doing this that he, he wanted us to sing the Celtic song of farewell. So if you, from your programs, if you take the green sheet. And it's a melody that I'm sure is very familiar to us. Once, you, once we get into it, you'll recognize it right away. But this is Father Pat's request that one way that we have of remembering him in prayer and as we sing this together, offering this hymn for the repose of his soul, we also pray and hope that he might be welcomed in the process of being welcomed into the presence of the Lord that he served so faithfully during his life, and that he might hear the words coming from the Lord, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. And so we sing. May choirs of angels lead you into paradise, and may the martyrs come to welcome you, to bring you home into the holy city that you may dwell in new jerusalem may holy angels be there at your welcoming with all the saints who go before you there, that you may Yeah. Uh.
God, the Almighty Father, raised Christ, his Son, from the dead. With confidence, we ask him to save all his people, living and dead. For Father Pat, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our brother who ate the body of Christ, the bread of life, that he may be raised up on the last day, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our brother, Father Pat, who served the church as a priest, that he may given, be given a place in the liturgy of heaven, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our deceased relatives and friends, and for all who have helped us, that they may have the reward of their goodness, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, especially Father James Fagan, Father Pat's high school principal and mentor, and Father Edward Boylan, Father Pat's pastor and mentor in his seminary days, and also his parents, that they may see God face to face, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the family and friends and parishioners of our brother, Father Pat, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend, Lazarus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an increase of vocations of service to the church, especially vocations like Father Pat's to the ministerial priesthood, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our shelter and our strength, you listen in love to the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for Father Pat and for all our departed brothers and sisters. Cleanse them of their sins and grant them the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And may the Lord accept the Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that through these holy mysteries, Patrick, your servant and priest, may behold with clarity forever what he faithfully ministered here through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. rightly gives you praise for through your son our Lord Jesus Christ by the power and working of the Holy Spirit you give life to all things and make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the Sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name therefore O Lord we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and John, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant, Father Patrick, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. When from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body. <coughs> after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages and praise you without end through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. <coughs> through him and with him and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Having received the sacrament of salvation, we implore your kindness, O God, for Patrick, your servant and priest, that as you made him a steward of your mysteries on earth, so you may bring him to be nourished by their truth and reality as unveiled in heaven through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite you all to be seated for a moment, and I invite Seamus Short, Father Pat's brother, to come forward and say a few words. Bishop, priests and religious of the Diocese of Jefferson City, as Dave said earlier on, it's with a heavy heart I am here. On behalf of my wife Eleanor and myself, our family, on behalf of my sister Anne, her husband Neil, and their family, my twin sisters who couldn't be with us, Kathleen in Dublin, and Eileen, <coughs> sorry, Kathleen in Cashel and Tipperary, and her family, and Eileen in Dublin, and her family. I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words about Father Pat and about the life and the lives, I suppose, that he lived. Because he was our older brother. He was the rock around which the family revolved. He brought me to school. He led me and everyone else in the family by example. Many of you, you might not have seen him when he was a fit physical man. <laughs> but so I said yesterday I made a mistake about being behind him. I wouldn't be able to follow up with him, but if you were in front of him, you might be moving out of the way. <laughs> Many of what was said today rings in my ear, you know, because Father Pat, he didn't stand around. He didn't talk too much about it. He might have, but then he got on and he did the job. He took it in both hands. He was in many ways a fixer. He was a doer. Whether it was a starter and a tractor in Moberly or Jeff City or at this parish here, if the starter was gone, there was somebody here could fix it. You know, if the handle was broken in the spade at home, he'd fix it. He'd have 10 of them fixed when I'd get a chance to see them. And um, born, of course, May Day, 1941. Went to primary school with me, went to the same secondary school with me, although he, uh, I didn't last it as long as he did. And, uh, of course, he went on a, on a longer journey. He worked uh, side by side as a boy. He was a man when he was a boy. He worked side by side with our late father. As a builder, carpenter, you name it, he could do it. He did everything that was possible to be done around the home. And when our late father got sick, he really put his shoulder to the wheel, in every sense of the word. But it didn't daunt him or dampen his enthusiasm to follow his pattern in life, his vocation. And he was ordained on the 12th of June, St. John's in Waterford. 12th of June, 1966, at his first Mass in our local parish church in Clown on the 13th. And there was a fair in the village that day. Cattle were all on the street. Men selling and buying. And, you know, that was part of what he was. He enjoyed that. 
And it was fitting, when I reflect on his life, that he made so many journeys home, a few of them sad ones, but he made an uh, <clears throat> the effort to come to all of them. And of course, the annual visit back home was the thing he really cherished. And when he came home, he told me about what happened at Our Lady of the Snows and the difficulty he had removing the snow away from the front door <laughs> with a big shovel. And then, of course, I suppose when he came back here, he told about all the labours he had back home in Ireland. <laughs> but realistically, when he came home every year, he did one month's work for me on the farm. No ceremony attached, up at five o'clock in the morning. Perhaps the last two days, he got into the Jeep and drove around the whole of Ireland for the last three or four days, maybe, to see all the people who befriended him all the relatives, all the neighbours and friends. And uh, I want, in recognition of the sickness that he's had, he struggled. I know when he came back for his 50th anniversary to our native parish, and that was something I will always cherish, that he was obviously in failing health, and that was a milestone in his lifetime and a memory for us and uh, I could see myself we never know when we'd fail in health but I could see him failing then maybe some of you didn't see it but I really could and uh, he said to my neighbour as he left at two o'clock in the morning uh, the neighbour said he'll be back again next year Pat and he said if I'm fit and I suppose that told its own story. And the, the year drifted on, and then, as you all, all know, uh, <clears throat> his condition deteriorated in the spring of last year. And he did suffer, I know, myself and Anne came over to visit him. In July, very sick man, but he gathered himself together and said, I appreciate you coming. And in that regard, I want to pay a special tribute to the dedication of this community. And I know I take a risk when I single out people, not just in this community, but right over the diocese and people that he was associated with. But the tremendous dedication of Thres and Dave Ream, that's too. And Glenn and Betty here on my right, who dedicatedly came to see him and kept us informed of how he was doing. And then he made a recovery of a kind, and we had hoped, and he had hoped. You know, as you all know, he was a fixer. And he believed he was invincible in many ways. That body of his could be repaired, but great people out there who could do it. But the final call came, and he left us. In sadness, but with great memories. And I try to, <clears throat> I appreciate very much the whole community here was here yesterday evening. And the genuine outpouring of sympathy towards us was unparalleled in my life. I'm grateful for that. I thank you for that. I thank all the people who visited him, who helped him through, through his career. And I know if, it was, if this was back home in Ireland, there'd be hundreds of thousands of people that supported him through the difficult days we had growing up as a family. And I know that people in this community and all the communities that he served in have helped him also. I tried in my own mind to bring together Father Pat's bodily hard-working life that he was very capable of and his vocation in religion. And I thought of a few lines that goes, who will plough the fields now? 
Who will sow the corn? Who will mind the horses now and keep them neatly shorn? The stack that's in the haggard, unthrashed it may remain, said Father Pat left us for heaven's lofty plain. Now, there's two sides to that. The one side is that, you know, the great work that he had done, he earned his bread by the sweat of his brow, and believe you me, when he came back at his weight and worked hard on the farm, he lost some sweat for me and for everybody else. But he also had the other, that was, he, brought, he sowed the crops, he brought them in from the harvest, he put them safely by for the winter. But I know there's nothing to give Father Pat greater satisfaction than to harvest souls for the Lord. In every parish he was in, he could recount the joy as an experience to me yesterday evening of people saying, he brought me into the church. And that was his harvest. And I hope and I pray that he's reached the reward of that harvest in his heavenly home. May his neighborly soul rest in peace. Thank you. Why don't you sit down for a minute and you're not coming. Thank you so much, Seamus. And uh, I just have two points to make. The first one, I am speaking not just personally, but on behalf of everybody here, everybody over in the gym, and all kinds of people who couldn't make it today, maybe. Uh, we wish you to make sure you communicate to your family our deep gratitude for your sacrifice in giving him to us for over 50 years. <laughs> the Irish clergy are a great part of the legacy of the Diocese of Jefferson City. And Patrick shared the um, inability of them to understand what a Missouri summer is <laughs> when he arrived in his woolen suit in July. But after that, as you say, he took root here beautifully in the fertile soil of Missouri, and we're so grateful. Secondly, I always tell people when we come to bury one of our pastors that it is a special grace of the church to be able to accompany your pastor to his place of rest. And beautifully, we began this, this wonderful liturgy today with that hymn, you remember the first words? I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Patrick was a good shepherd. And to be a good shepherd, you have to embrace the urging of St. Paul when it comes to our Lord and Master Jesus Christ whose unique priesthood we share. He must increase, I must decrease. And so there can be no better memory and cherish, cherishing of the memory of Father Patrick Short than from us recognizing as good sheep, both as he was a pastor among us, that he tried to truly reflect the voice of Jesus, he's leading us now, and he wants us to follow him because we have a great reward awaiting when we all have our reunion. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. Amen. May his soul and the soul of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Would like to invite you all to the cemetery, those that you feel like you could walk with us, um, please feel free to do so. 
Uh, Lloyd Belt has provided two vans, and we may have another bus if people would like uh, to ride to the cemetery. Um, any of you that are in the, the uh, parish center right now, um, you can join us as we walk to the cemetery. If you feel like that you uh, will not uh, be able to, to go, just go ahead to the parish hall, and I invite you all to a, a dinner provided by the parish, a luncheon, uh, immediately after our, our prayers at the cemetery. Um, Bishop Gatos, thank you for being here. And uh, people have asked a lot of questions, and so I'll just briefly say that if you would like uh, to see a YouTube video of this Mass, um, you can go to our diocesan website, and in the upper right-hand corner of the web, uh, the homepage is the YouTube symbol. Click on that YouTube symbol, and uh, you will be able to uh, pass that along to others if, if those that didn't get to see us or didn't get to watch it live um, would like to be a part of the funeral, they can watch it on that page. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again, when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself.
Turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant. And help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith. Until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask.